All right, we've talked a bit about descriptive versus inferential statistics. We've talked about when to use percentages, when to use means of central tendency. And now I'm going to start talking about the shape of distributions and their variance so we can talk a little bit more about the difference between uh, how means and medians are affected. And this will all kind of dovetail with some stuff that we end up talking about in uh, inferential statistics as well. So when you are doing any statistical testing uh, or when you are just collecting data, um, there is a way to describe the way that data is distributed. We've talked about modes a little bit in the last video, um, but a lot of variables tend to fall along something called the normal distribution. And this I have up here is what the normal distribution looks like. Um, it tends, it is peaked in the middle, it is symmetrical, um, it uh, tends to have, as you can see here, about 68 or exactly 68% of the responses falling within one standard deviation of the mean. Um, and almost all of the responses, 99.7% of them falling uh, within the uh, three standard deviations of the mean. Um, so this is what it looks like, but your data is not always going to go along the normal distribution. But we'll talk in inferential statistics how there is an assumption that your data or the differences between two groups in your data is going to be normally distributed like this. But for now, let's just talk about uh, what this looks like. I mentioned that this is symmetrical. What I mean by that in more technical terms is that there's no skew. Skew in your data uh, means that your distribution is off-center one way or the other. And we'll talk about how that affects mean and median in a bit. The other less common and more technical word I have here is kurtosis. Normal distributions have no kurtosis. Uh, and that means they're not too flat or too peaked. If you had a distribution that was more peaked than this one, it was taller, that would be called leptokurtotic. Um, again, not something you need to memorize, but I'm just trying to help uh, enrich this a little bit. Um, and if it were flatter, it would be called platykurtotic. Lepto, like it's leaping up. Platy rhymes with flat E, I guess. Um, but those are just the ways that you describe the shape of your data. And you can have skew to the left or the right. And I'll describe what that is in just a moment. Um, so here are some examples actually of that left and right skew. Um, and it, I think a lot of people, when they think about the distribution leaning left or right, they kind of have the assumption of what left and right means backwards. So left skew doesn't mean that the hump is leaning left. It means that the tail is going off to the left. Because the idea basically is that it, this would be a more or less normal distribution if it were not for these few extreme scores off to the left. So the tail, not the hump, is where we're talking about the skew. So this is left skewed, tailing off to the left in the negative direction. This is positive or right skew, tailing off to the right or positive direction. So remember, uh, if we look back to this normal distribution that I have here, um, the special thing about a normal distribution, or a symmetrical distribution, I guess, is that it is uh, the mean the median and the mode are all exactly the same. Uh, the most frequent score, the mode, is represented by the highest point, the middle. Uh, the median is represented by the middle because there's 50% below the median, 50% above the median. And the mean is in the middle because uh, it's totally symmetrical with an equal number uh, of scores of the same values on both sides. So the mean, median, mode are all exactly in the middle. But like I mentioned, extreme scores and the shape of the distribution can affect uh, the median and the mean a little bit more than the mode. So uh, let's take this left skewed example here to illustrate that. If these tailing extreme negative scores were not here, the mean, median, and mode would still all be in the same place here. But because we do have these extreme scores, it kind of drags the median and the mean over. And like I mentioned, the mean is more affected by those extreme scores than the median and much more affected by the mode that isn't affected at all. So adding these extreme scores 
uh, when you are calculating a mean, remember you're just adding everything together and dividing it by whatever number of observations you have. So every score is treated equally and extreme scores then have a bigger impact on the mean. Um, so by, you know, let's say the average here was 50 and we have lots of scores that are around 50 and then you add a bunch of scores over here that are like two or three or something. That's gonna pull that mean over uh, quite a bit. The median gets pulled over too, but not nearly as uh, much. It just moves over because there happen to be more scores over here. So you need to shift it over a bit to make sure you still have half the scores above and half the scores below. So the mean is much more affected uh, by extreme scores than the median. And you can see with a right or positive skewed distribution, it's just the opposite effects, right? Uh, that when you have these extreme positive scores, it's gonna pull the mean more positive and pull the median a bit uh, as well. Um, so that's how skew and the shape of these distributions can affect your central tendency measures. So imagine that you are uh, collecting scores in a, uh, let's just stick with my boring old math example that I always tend to use. You're looking at math scores. Let's say you make that math test a little bit too easy and you tend to have uh, you know, a lot of positive scores here, but it trails off here in the negative direction. So your mode, your most frequent scores might be that people are doing really well. Uh, and that tends to be true that most people are doing very, very well. But a few negative scores of people that, you know, maybe you are not paying attention or people that really uh, are having trouble with the instrument um, are moving the media, or sorry, the mean down quite a bit. So you might have a false uh, impression that people are doing kind of average or maybe C or B minus kind of level of uh, uh, scoring on your uh, math test when really most people are doing pretty well. And there are just a few uh, uh, problem scores that really need to be addressed. So you, you can't just assume that your mean really fully describes your data in the best possible way. You need to take it all into account and understand the shape of your data in order to really interpret what that mean actually indicates. Um, I mentioned this a little bit already too, the modality can affect shape. Uh, if you're looking at average body weight in the United States, like I mentioned, it's, it's uh, usually going to be bimodal because men and women uh, on average are going to tend to have different weights. So you might almost think of this as like a uh, two distributions that are just overlapping each other. There's one distribution for men and there's one distribution uh, for women, you know, not accounting for all the different gender identities that might be uh, inappropriately subsumed into this graph. Um, but if you just took the mean of this, you might have something in, you know, the 179 pound range or something like that, let's say. And that would describe the average body weight in the United States, I guess, if that's what we're looking at. But it wouldn't really describe things as completely as if you looked at the data and realized that it was uh, split in, in two with these two different distributions. So looking at your data and how it is laid out can really help you, you know, maybe make follow-up decisions that you might need to use to um, adapt your analysis style or how you're reporting it a little bit more. Um, modality also, if you have, uh, you know, lots of extreme scores can affect your uh, median and mean. It's just another way beyond skew. Uh, if you, you might even think of this as like an extreme version of skew where instead of tailing scores over here, you just have like a clump uh, on this side, but you know, pretend we used to have a normal distribution here and uh, on whatever this measure happens to be, we had a bunch of people that got uh, three points above the mean all of a sudden. Well, uh, that's gonna drag that mean over quite a bit while it's not going to affect the normal mode and it's barely going to affect the median. But one little clump over here is gonna really change the mean um, and affect your understanding of this data quite a bit. So, um, this is a reason that when some people are using even you know descriptive statistics or uh, doing their tests in inferential statistics, people might use medians instead of means. Now, the default for any type of those tests is to use the mean because, again, it is more robust to sampling differences. Um, 
but you can see that it is affected by extreme scores in a way uh, that is really problematic sometimes. So looking at your data and having an understanding of that and maybe even running the test both ways, using the mean and the median as the central tendency measure is a useful way to do it, or even reporting both of them. The main lesson here though, um, that I will repeat when we get to inferential statistics is that you can't just collect your data and just plug it into a spreadsheet and run your analyses. You need to look at it. You need to have an understanding of uh, the descriptive statistics and how they all fit together and how they might be affected by circumstances in your data. Um, you need to make sure your data looks how you expect it to. That's usually going to be that it's normally distributed with some key exceptions that might have to do with, you know, multimodal distributions and things like that. Um, and you also need to make sure your data conforms to the assumptions of the tests that you're going to run. And we'll talk about that more in inferential stats, but every test has a set of assumptions uh, about the shape of the data, the scale of measurement, the way that it, the variability fits together. There are all these different things that um, determine if your test is appropriate. And if your test violates those assumptions, then the test might not work correctly. It might be too conservative. It might be totally unreliable. Um, so you need to have an understanding of your data beyond just, I got numbers, I run test, right? It needs to be a little more nuanced than that. Okay, uh, I want to talk a little bit about variability and then outliers to wrap up descriptive statistics. So we've already talked about shape a little bit, and you might think of variability as an aspect of the shape of your data. Variability is just how dispersed or spread out your scores are. So in a way, it has to do with that idea of kurtosis, uh, right? That if they're really spread out, it might be more flat and platykurtotic. If they're really concentrated, it might be more peaked and leptokurtotic. So some ways to conceptualize variability. Uh, first, range. Range is just how far does your data span? Uh, what is the smallest score and what is the largest score? Um, so that one is, is pretty simple. Um, and you might think about these scores, you know, some of them, uh, some of these terms describe different things about variability in much the same way that mode, median, and mean describe different things about the central tendencies of your data, right? So range matters by understanding the sort of boundaries of your data. Variance matters um, because it doesn't just look at the ends. It looks at how everything is distributed. Uh, it is a, there's an equation to calculate variance that is how much everything deviates from the mean squared and then add it all together. Um, and standard deviations is just, you know, that uh, idea not squared. So variance and standard deviation are very much tied together. There's an average deviation from the mean. Uh, if you square it, you have the variance. So these things, again, are uh, totally tied together, but they help indicate slightly different things uh, for us and are used slightly differently in calculations. Um, so as you have probably already understood from how I've described this at this point, let's say we have a distribution, maybe the blue one is close to a normal distribution and that's kind of medium variability. If it was more peaked and it was covering less of an area of that X axis, the horizontal axis that might indicate lower variability. And if it were even more spread out, more uh, flattened and platykurtotic, uh, that would be really high variability. Um, so these distributions are all pretty different. And if they're too peaked or too flat uh, at a certain amount that we don't need to necessarily get into in this class, but if they're really out of whack in one direction or another, then that's going to make your test uh, not work properly as well. One last thing to mention that kind of fits into variability is an idea you probably remember from stats, uh, outliers. Um, outliers are abnormally extreme scores in your data. So you can see here, just a, a play example here that, you know, you have these uh, scores, a, a, dens a density here that is kind of normal looking, kind of peaked in the middle. Um, and then you have a score or maybe even more than one outside of that uh, normal range a bit. So that is what we might call an outlier. And we know that extreme scores like these outliers can affect the mean in a way that is a little bit artificial. So what do we do with these outliers when we know that they are doing an undue uh, amount of influence on our data? 
Um, so they're affecting the mean. They might even be affecting the median a bit, depending on how many of them you have. Um, so one thing you might do is, you know, do the test with the mean and the median. But if you have outliers, they might still be affecting your data in a way that is kind of um, unrepresentative and making these normal scores really seem further away from the mean or seem closer to the mean on this side than they actually are. So that's going to really affect your test. Um, so this can really change your median mean and it can mess up the test that you're running. Like I'm trying to, sorry, I'm a little repetitive, but I just want to get that home. Um, so what can you do with outliers? Well, you can do a couple of different things. Um, one thing uh, that you could do is just called trimming where you just cut off some of the scores um, that you have a rule ahead of time that you're just going to cut off the uh, you know half a percent on either side so you cut off the one percent most extreme scores uh, or even five or ten percent you know if you're using tons and tons of data like you have people making like dozens or hundreds of reaction time judgments you know maybe you cut ten percent of those scores because you you know having ninety percent of those is still a lot but if you, you know, have a sample of 200 participants that all made a single judgment for your dependent variable, you're not going to cut 10% there because that data is too uh, valuable. But again, if you had, you know, hundreds or thousands of responses, then maybe 10% doesn't matter that much. Um, but trimming is pretty extreme in some ways that it can, uh, it can change the shape of your data. Uh, and, you know, maybe you want to change the shape of this data because this is uh, unreasonable. But completely cutting out a score just because it's extreme might you know, also be problematic. An alternative to trimming is called Windsorizing. Windsorizing is when you take those outliers and replace them with the most extreme scores. So this score, you would take away this 1500 or whatever it happens to be and just replace it in the data with uh, 1000 or whatever this uh, little spot here happens to be. Uh, so replacing the most extreme scores with the next most extreme scores. Um, and this maintains the idea that, you know, you're showing that the other variables you're interested in are still uh, producing extreme scores, but not so extreme that they're messing up your distribution. Um, so we're going to circle back to this stuff a lot, but all these types of decisions that you can make in statistics have the ability to be abused, right? Um, people can use this trimming or a process of getting rid of outliers to, you know, make their data say what they want it to sometimes. Um, so do people actually abuse this process? There are reports uh, from Bert Backer and a colleague that looked uh, at whether people actually are doing this to a point that it's messing up the data uh, or the, uh, the literature, you know, how often are people abusing the outlier reduction process? It doesn't seem like it's a huge problem. However, just last week, I was, uh, uh, because I'm a masochist, looking at academic Twitter and uh, seeing somebody who had looked at the data of uh, a paper that they found a little bit suspect, and they found that these people had, uh, the authors of that paper, had just cut some outliers to make their data say what they wanted it to. So it does happen. It can be a problem. It's like, you know, how there are not that many people being totally fraudulent about their data, but it, it does happen. Um, so if you see something in a paper that seems like a weird decision rule or, um, you know, seems kind of suspect or like it shouldn't have affected their data that much, you know, it's possible that they either accidentally or unfortunately on purpose did something that changed the answers for themselves. And people oftentimes, you know, when we're faced with word count deadlines or word count limits and deadlines to revise things, like maybe people leave it out that they're even taking outliers uh, out of their data. That's a problem. Ideally, we would all have decision rules uh, about trimming outliers. So it's never left up to our own subjective decision-making after the fact. We would always say, in this study that I'm about to conduct, I'm going to trim 1% on both sides, uh, and that will be what I do. And I won't deviate from that. And if I do, then I will make it explicit that I've changed my process here so people can give it the proper scrutiny. So having those things said in a pre-registered way, said ahead of time, uh, might be a helpful fix. All right, that's all I have for descriptive statistics right now. Um, I know you're all super excited to get back into statistics in a couple weeks when we talk about inferential ones, but I promise we'll be back. Don't worry about it. I know you're champing at the bit.